Welcome to chapter two, part one. Chapter two is about cognition. And so we're gonna talk a lot about different forms of cognition and what we need to understand about cognition. So in this first section, we're gonna talk about some basic ideas and then we'll get into some other, uh, some other important piece of information in the second half of this chapter. So the first half, let's start with a kind of a review question. A belief is a form of, the answer is cognition. I think it's a good guess, right? So remember, psychology is all about the ABCs, affect, behavior, cognition. Affect means feelings. So one and three on this, on this list, those are the same thing. Affect and feelings, same thing. Behavior is separate. And then cognition is anything that we process in our brain, right? So any information that we process in our brain. A belief is actually not an affect because belief is a kind of a statement of fact. So I believe that, um, that uh, a Twix is a delicious form of candy bar, right? That is uh, a belief. It's not saying that I love the Twix, that I want the Twix. I'm just saying that I believe that it is delicious. That's it. All right. Let's move on and talk about several other forms of cognition. So today, we are going to differentiate recognition from recall, specifically when we discuss memory and ideas of memory, how it is good and accurate, how it's not. And that includes ideas of order effects. Then later on, and we're going to talk a little bit about priming and schemas and the method of loci. So you've seen some of that is going to happen in the second half of this particular chapter. So let's go ahead and begin with this basic question. Could you recognize a penny? I'm talking about a US one cent piece if you saw one. When we ask this question, most people say that they would strongly agree with that one. Okay, no big deal. Okay, you'd recognize a penny, good for you. Next, can you accurately draw a penny from memory? Like, could you draw it on a piece of paper? This is a little bit different because people tend to be about half and half, depending on how good of an artist they think they are. Now, you told me that you could at least recognize it, even if you can't draw it. So, tell me which one it is. Which one of these is a real penny? So why was that difficult, right? Why was it difficult for you to tell me whether or not wh which one of these pennies is the real penny? You told me you would recognize one. One of those is a real penny. Why can't you just tell me which one it is? What's the big deal? By the way, that is the real penny. Number six was the real penny. All the other ones look like pennies, but they're not actual pennies because there's mistakes and there's differences. So what we need to discuss is the difference between recognition and recall. Recognition and recall and what makes it easy and what makes it hard. Recognition is a form of memory and so is recall. Recall is also a form of memory. Memory is a form of cognition. It's the way we process information. When you recognize something though, that is like a multiple choice test. Here are all the correct answers and you have to recognize which one is correct. It's different than a short answer or an essay type of a question, in which case you have to produce it out of nothing. It's not a matter of recognizing, it's a matter of, uh, it's a, it's a matter of creating it out of your head. So the difference happens to be similar to these forms of criminology. So if you look here, this is a lineup of men. And number three here is David Ranta. And David Ranta was identified on a lineup. This is a recognition task, recognizing which is the correct answer. So in this case, they'd have all the men in front of you. And you have to say, all right, which one it is? Which one is, uh, is the man who committed this crime? And they said, oh, it's number three. Well, it turns out that uh, David Ranta was not correctly identified. He was not the one who committed the crime. But because he was identified in a lineup like this, he was sentenced to 23 years, well, he was freed after 23 years of prison time. Recall is more of like a police sketch, okay? Instead of which one of these guys did it, it's describe the person who did it. Now, what makes it easier or harder? When we were looking at the pennies, this was difficult for you. And one of the reasons why it was so difficult is because these are so similar. 
the features that you recognize a penny, all of these had the features that you would recognize to be a penny. However, only one of them had them in the correct order or in the correct positions. Normally, it's, recognition is not too hard because the choices are quite different. You've probably taken a multiple choice test where that was not the case, where the, the different options were actually quite similar to each other. It makes it quite difficult. Recall, on the other hand, is when there's specific details that you need to recall, that is often difficult to do as well, and specifically to understand how to, to recall them in a way that they can be distinguished or particular enough for the question being asked. So, generally, we consider recognition tasks to be easier. However, there are certain ways that they can be quite difficult, and so can recall. Either way, though, we can be quite, um, I don't know the word, it's uh, maybe less effective in the way that we actually have memory. So to show you this, whether it's recognition or recall, our memory is not a videotape. And it's not a, a, a photograph, right? If, if you think you have a photographic memory, you're almost certainly deluding yourself, right? There's, that's just not true. If that was the case, then you would immediately say, oh, well, you know, I got a photographic memory. I'm just going to look through my little memory in, uh, and look up the picture of a penny and then pick it out. And there it is. That's not what happens in our memory. Our memory, we don't, we don't have like videotapes. We don't have uh, a list of file of pictures that we go through and compare it. Instead, what we do is we recreate the memory based off of the information that we have and the information that we, we can recall. Let me give you some examples. So what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video. Now, I should warn you that this video does have some violence in it. There are people hitting each other. Uh, so, but we're going to watch this video. And then you need to determine as if you were a witness to a crime, to the crime being, uh, being seen, uh, what you might recall and not recall. So what we're going to do, you're going to watch this. You're going to remember what happened. And then we're going to come back and ask specific questions so that you can see whether or not you were correct. All right, now that you've seen the video, we're gonna ask some questions. So first, which of these objects was used as a weapon? This one tends to be pretty easy for people because they, they're, able to, um, they're able to recognize in a list which one it is. And almost everybody, when we ask this, can recognize and remember that it was a broom. Some other questions, though, tend to be a little bit more difficult. So let's do another question. From that scenario that you just watched, what color hat was that second older attacker wearing? So we're, I'm separating the attacker from the victim. The victim is the person being hit. And I think it's pretty obvious who that was. And then there was a first person attacking the victim. And then the second one was the one I'm talking about. So imagine that I'm the police officer. and I'm saying, all right, we need to identify this, uh, this other guy that, uh, that was attacking. So uh, was he wearing a hat? What color was it? When we ask this question, here's the kind of results we get. A lot of people said dark blue, but 30% will say that there was no hat at all. Now, were you there? Were, were you watching? Isn't your memory a videotape? or a photograph, and can't you just go and look through and see, was there a hat or was there not a hat? If I need to identify, I'm the police officer, I need to identify this person, shouldn't you be able to tell me what hat they were wearing? Here's another question. How many times did that same person, the second older attacker, how many times did that person strike the victim? How many times? All right, when we asked this, we got all sorts of different answers. There is no majority answer. The, would this be important to know? If, if we were the police and you were, and you were the eyewitness and you had to testify about this experience, would that be something that you should know? How many times? How many times were, was, the, was the guy getting hit? Wouldn't that be pertinent information? Much less identifying characteristics like what the man is wearing. Your memory is not a videotape. And it's not a photograph. It's something that gets recreated depending on certain circumstances. 
So go ahead and watch this video again, and you'll see what the answers are. Our memory is flawed and it's malleable. We're gonna talk specifically about, uh, there's lots of different studies that show this, but one specific study is by Wade and Wade's colleagues in 2002. And in this, they actually created a fake childhood memory. You're like, what? Create, how can you create a fake childhood memory? I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I don't know if you've been talking with somebody. Let's, let's pretend it's your mom, right? So you're like, oh, oh yeah, you remember that time when we did this and this and this and this? And your mom's like, oh yeah, I remember, but it wasn't, it wasn't there. It was somewhere over here. And that wasn't, uh, it wasn't at your grandma's house. It was your Aunt Jane's house. And when you were there, it wasn't you that did that. It was your cousin. You're like, no, mom, I was there. And you're like, and your mom's like, no, I was there. I think I remember. And then you start arguing about what happened even though you were both there, your memory is not a videotape where you can just look it up and figure it out. Your memory is something that gets recreated, reconstructed in the time to the point that you actually take information and you create that memory based off information that is now. What do I mean by that? So in this particular study by Wade et al., here's what they did. They showed 18 to 20 year old participants, uh, a photograph of them, particularly at, it was a photograph of them um, at a, a county fair, if I'm not mistaken, right? So like doing something like taking a hot air balloon ride. And they're like, okay, so here's the photo. And it was a doctored photo, it was a fake photo, okay? And they said, hey, here's the photo. Do you remember this? It was not real. No one actually had this happen to them. But 50%, 50% of the people remembered the experience even though it never happened. 50% of the people remembered an experience that never, ever happened. Why? Because they were given pieces of information that were pertinent, and they said, oh, because this is not a videotape and I can't just look at my own uh, memory, I will just have to base it off of what I have. And in this case, I have this photo, and so, yeah, that fits. And so this is not uh, a true memory. Another way that we can see flawed memories is an example by Loftus and Palmer. So Elizabeth Loftus and her colleagues, but specifically her, she's one of the most famous uh, people about eyewitness testimony and showing how eyewitness testimony is very flawed and malleable. So here's the classic study, and you can see this uh, on the screen here. What they would do is they would give people, they would have people come in, participants would come in, and they would show them a video. The video was of a car crash. Now, everybody saw exactly the same video. It was exactly the same. But when they asked them things like how fast were the cars going, they would change the verb of how fast were the cars going when they, and if you see at the bottom of the graph, when they contacted each other, when they hit each other, when they bumped each other, when they collided with each other, when they smashed each other, okay? Even though the video was exactly the same, how they asked the question mattered. When they used the word smashed, people estimated that they were going over 40 miles per hour on average. When they said contacted, people estimated in the 30 mile per hour range, nearly a 10 mile per hour difference, not based off of what they saw, but based off of the information that was given in the question. How fast were they going when they contacted each other? versus how fast were they going when they smashed into each other. And when, you, when they asked, did you see any broken glass? There was none, by the way. There was no broken glass in the video. If they had said hit, about 14% of the people remembered seeing broken glass when there was none. But when they used the word smashed, about a third of the people remembered broken glass when there was none. Now, this is not something that's illegal. When, if you were in a court of law, and they were asking you questions, the lawyers can use different verbs. There's nothing illegal about this. But the eyewitness testimony changes based off the information that you have now, even subtle forms of information like how fast the cars were going when they, and then use whatever verb, contacted versus smashed, whatever verb happens to fit your point of view. Again, with, uh, with ideas of criminal justice in this case, when, uh, when they looked at 
people who are exonerated for crimes, and this is based off of 239 uh, exonerations, the thing that was most likely to make them, uh, to have them be um, uh, convicted in the first place was actually eyewitness misidentification. Uh, other things, other things were less likely, but eyewitness misidentification mm -hmm. was the highest number for people to be wrongfully uh, convicted of a crime. Now, I am not saying that we should get rid of eyewitness identification. I'm just saying that we should know that your memory is flawed and it's malleable. And sometimes we take piece of information now to remember things in the past. And that memory will change based off the information that we have available to us, even though that might lead us to a less objectively true memory. When we think about memories, the classic way of understanding memories is through the different systems, that is sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory are three different kinds of memory that you have right now, that you have right now. So let's start with the beginning. So you should know the difference between how these work both in their capacity as well as their duration. Their capacity, how much they can remember. The duration, how long it will stay in that memory. So the first one is sensory memory. You actually can remember everything. Sensory memory says that whatever you take in with your senses, whatever you see, whatever you touch, whatever you hear, whatever you smell, everything that you take in with your senses right now, you remember. You remember the screen, you remember what I look like, you remember whatever's in the background, you remember whatever you're seeing, whatever you're hearing, whatever you're feeling, touching, everything. You remember all of it. You remember everything. The capacity for sensory memory is unlimited. You remember everything, but you only remember it for a very short period of time. The idea here is, as you're going through your life, you actually have to take in everything. And for a small, like fraction of a second, kind of up to a, maybe a few seconds, depending on the, the sense that we're talking about, uh, for a very, very short period of time, you actually remember all that stuff. However, you don't recall it because it only gets to the next level it only gets to your short-term memory if it grabs your attention most of the stuff that you take in right now in your senses you will remember for a very short period of time and then you'll immediately get rid of you'll immediately forget because it's not important it's not going to change you you're not going to trip over it you're not it's not going to hurt you it has nothing to do with with you and what needs your attention and so you immediately forget it but Sensory memory happens first, and we know that even though we may not realize it, we actually take in basically everything. And then only the stuff that grabs your attention gets to your short-term memory. Short-term memory, or STM, is also sometimes called working memory. This is the stuff that you are working with right now. This is the stuff that you're thinking about, that you are aware of. That's your short-term memory. None of these other memory stores are, are things that you're aware of, right? Only the stuff that, you're, that you are aware of now, if that's all in your short-term memory. Your short-term memory is much more limited. Your short-term memory can only remember seven plus or minus two chunks of information. And the, the duration, it depends on what researcher you're asking. It's generally only between about 30 seconds and, and a couple of minutes. We're not, we're not talking about more than about five minutes of, of time. Between about 30 seconds, five minutes, you can have something in your memory. So you can only remember seven plus or minus two chunks of information for a couple of minutes at the most. And you're like, wait a minute, that can't be right. What are you talking about? I remember my entire phone number and that's 10 digits long so that's 10 things that i'm remembering right now no you can only remember seven plus or minus two chunks of information how things get chunked together can be very different so for example if you remember the alphabet the alphabet is one chunk of information no matter how many letters it is you remember it as one piece of information uh, if you've ever been in, let's say, like a, a play in high school or somewhere else, right? You might be able to remember lots of different lines, more than seven. Why? Because you chunk the entire conversation or the entire scene or the entire play together. 
people who have great memories are really good at making chunks of information, connecting pieces of information together so that they are able to use them. Now, sometimes those things are not easy to chunk together. And if you remember, sometimes you're asked to go pick up something at the store. And you can either write it down, which is a good idea, by the way, or one thing you can do is called maintenance rehearsal. You maintenance rehearsal means you just repeat it over and over. And what you do when you repeat it over and over is you reset the clock. Remember, the capacity is seven plus or minus two. The duration is about 30 seconds to a couple minutes, right? And so every time you repeat it, you start that clock over, okay? That is called maintenance rehearsal. You keep it in there by restarting the clock, restarting the clock. So if I need to remember bread, flowers, eggs, milk, uh, peanut butter, bread, flowers, egg, el ma eggs, milk, peanut butter, bread, flowers, egg, milk. That is, I'm maintaining rehearsal, right? I restart the clock every time I say it. And that way, by the time I get to the store, I can remember and then let it go because I won't need it anymore. Now, the other problem with short-term memory is that whatever information we're working with, it's got to be in your short-term memory. That means that your long-term memory, you don't think in your long-term memory. What you do is you take things from your long-term memory so you can use them in your short-term memory and then you can put them back. To get things into your long-term memory though, that's a little bit harder, right? So to encode something means to put it into your long-term memory. One of the best ways that we encode information is through something called elaborative rehearsal. Elaborative rehearsal is something we mentioned last time. It's when you take new information and you connect it with old information that's already there, that's already in your long-term memory. And when you connect those things, it makes it easier for you to maintain it in the long-term memory. Because besides actually getting it to be in your long-term memory, you've got to keep it in there, right? So you've got to encode it, you've got to maintain it, and then you've got to retrieve it. Now, the capacity and duration of long-term memory is unlimited. That is, it can stay there for as long as we know, and it can have as much as you need to. However, that doesn't mean that everything stays in there and everything stays in there the whole time. We know that some things do fade away and that we lose some things in our long-term memory. So to effectively remember stuff, you have to have stuff in your long-term memory that you can uh, be able to access later on through a form of retrieval, uh, which is taking things out of your long-term memory so you can use it in your short-term memory. Okay. We're going to do an example. Now, this is an example for CU Boulder. Norland Library is the main library on campus, UMC. That's the student union. So uh, let me know if you'd be able to get from the library to the student union. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about putting things into your long-term memory. Now, when I ask this at CU Boulder, most everybody says, yes, they can do this. Here's another question. Who was the third vice president, not president, vice president of the United States? The answer is Aaron Burr. Now, Hamilton's make this, made this example uh, a, little, a little bit easier than it used to be. But what we're going to do is these are actual um, vice presidents of the United States. So what we're going to do is we're going to memorize the vice presidents of the United States. And not only that, we're going to remember them in order. We're going to remember the last names of the vice presidents of the United States in order, at least uh, six of them, okay? In order. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to use elaborative rehearsal to take what we already know and connect what we don't know. So the things that we already know, that is the steps on the path from the library to the student union. Okay, we already know how to get there. We know how that's done. Now, what we don't know is the order of the vice presidents of the United States. So what we're going to do is we are going to connect each vice president of the United States with a different location, a different location on the way from the student union all the way to the library. So here's what we are going to do. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at these with the vice president's names. I'm going to show you a photo first the library and then different parts on the path. And we need to figure out a way of elaborative rehearsal. That is trying to, um, trying to connect this new piece of information with the other. So for example, this is the library. First vice president of the United States is John Adams, okay? 
So what can we do to connect this photo in our brain that we already have there with John Adams? How can we do it? Well, some people might say uh, Adams sounds like academic. Now, the way we do this can be silly. Can, whatever is effective for you. So Adams, uh, libraries are academic, academic Adams, academic Adams. Whenever I see the library, I think about academic Adams, right? Or you can even say, oh, look, the columns, they look like they're making an A right there. And A stands for Adams. Get any way you want to, that would work. Jefferson. So this is the way we're going to go. We're going to go uh, through this little quad. So Jefferson, how am I going to remember that this is Jefferson? Well, maybe for me, I can remember that Jefferson had a plantation. And so this wide open field is like Jefferson's plantation. Okay. Who had a plantation? Jefferson had a plantation. So this next one is Aaron Burr. So, uh, how are we going to remember this picture with Aaron Burr? Uh, Burr, Burr. So one way we can think about this is um, a burr is a thorn, and I got a I got a thorn in my tire. I got a burr in my bicycle tire, and it popped my tire. Aaron Burr. Or um, maybe uh, one of the posters on the uh, the kiosk there is really mean. I'm like, oh, burr, that's cold. I can't believe you would say that. That kind of thing. Okay. So that's Aaron Burr, Burr in the tire, Burr, that's cold. Okay. Clinton, Clinton. So the next one was, if I'm not mistaken, it's George Clinton. We only have to remember the last name though. So this pathway is gonna be Clinton, Clinton. So uh, I think in this case, we're gonna have um, Clinton and this, you're going between two trees. Clinton was president, uh, Not in this case, we're not talking about this Clinton, but uh, uh, President Clinton was b between two bushes, right? So Bush Senior and Bush and the second Bush. Uh, so I see the two trees. That's like going between two bushes, two bushes. Clinton was between two bushes. Gary, so for this particular picture, uh, I think that that statue is kind of scary. Uh, and so scary Gary, I remember this being scary Gary that I see those things and I get, and I hear scary Gary. Then Tompkins. So Tompkins sounds like pumpkins. And I think that the reddish orangish stone looks like a pumpkin. And that reminds me of Tompkin. So Tompkin and pumpkin. Now these don't, the elaborate rehearsals just have to be effective. They don't have to be logical. They could be totally as, as silly as you want. In fact, often the novel or silly makes them more effective. So in this case, I remember this being Tompkin because orange reminds me of pumpkins. All right, here's what we're going to do. Let's practice. This vice president, so this is the library. Who's the vice president? This was Adams. This green field, that was Jefferson. This pathway, Aaron Burr. This pathway, Clinton. This one, Gary. And then finally, Tompkins. Okay, what we just did is called the method of loci. So the way you do this is you think about locations, right? Whether it's a path like we just did, but it can be other paths as well. It could be even imagine yourself sitting on your bed in your bedroom and then going from left to right in, a, in, in throughout your bedroom and each thing is connected with something new. Now, what you do is you map each item on to, um, onto a different part of your, of your locations, right? Method of loci is the method of locations. The new thing is connected with old things that you know really well. The old thing you know really well is locations. Excuse me. Now, this only works if you have an effective way of connecting it that is unique and different. So you don't mix up uh, Gary, you know, Gary being scary here and being scared of wide open spaces, right? So if you, if you mix those up, 
then you lose the sequence. You've got to have it be pretty unique. And you cannot use, you should not, use the same locations for different sequences. One way, by the way, if you're ever in, uh, if you're taking an exam in a specific room, use actual parts of that room to remember uh, different things. And you'll be able to just look around the room and you should be able to remember things if you've done it effectively. Let's do another memory uh, demonstration. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you 15 words, one at a time. You're gonna see 15 words, you're gonna see them one at a time. You're gonna see each one for exactly three seconds each. Then we're all gonna sit here and stare at each other for 60 seconds. What you're gonna do is after that 60 seconds is done, you are going to write down, I'll give you a place to write down on this computer, right? Write down as many of the 15 words as you can and try and remember them in order if you possibly can, all right? So while you're seeing the words, don't just look at them. Just look at them, try and remember. Just each one for three seconds apiece. Then we're gonna sit here and stare. You're not gonna do anything. And then you're gonna write them all down. Uh, and then we'll move on from there. Here we go. Okay, we're gonna wait for 60 seconds. Okay, write down as many as you can. Okay, now that you've written them down, I want you to look at what the right answers were. So these are all of the correct answers. So what I want you to tell me is, did you remember most from which one of these groups? You remembered most from which ones of these groups? Now, the reason why this is a big deal is because when we get a new sequence, there's a few things that we need to, to talk about here in terms of memory. Whenever we get something specifically in a sequence, we're gonna remember things, we tend to remember things at the beginning of a list and at the end of a list. So the first part and the second part. Things at the beginning of the list, remembering those is called the primacy effect. Primacy means beginning, right, first. So when you remember things at the beginning of a list, that's the primacy effect. When you tend to remember things at the end of the list, that's called the recency effect because you've seen them most recently. The stuff in the middle tends to be less likely that you remember it. When we were waiting, I showed you a bunch of different icons and things. Let's talk about distractions. There's something called cognitive load. Cognitive load is that you can only process a certain amount of information, right? You only have a certain number of resources in order to process information cognitively. Well, being able to, having to pay attention to other stuff tries to take away those resources. So while you were trying to remember those 15 words, other things might be distracting you, right? So I could hear my kids upstairs, uh, I, other stuff like that. That was distracting you. 
Distractions create load and make it so that you cannot process information as well. What does that mean when you are in class and you're texting? Or you're supposed to be studying, but you're trying to watch Game of Thrones at the same time. If you try and do both at the same time, it's going to, you're going to overload yourself, right? You will not be able to put the resources where you need them to be. So distractions create load. They cause what we call cognitive load. Now, is the word sleep on your list? If the word sleep is on your list, and 34% generally say that it is, we have just created a memory for you. This is the list. The word sleep is not on that list. There is no word sleep on, you were not shown that word. If you remember that you saw sleep, then we have created a memory in you. Why? Because it's all part, this all, these, most of them anyway, are connected with sleeping, right? And so when we talk about snore and exhausted and silent and sheets and bedroom, right? Those all remind you of sleep. And so the concept of sleep was made more accessible uh, in your brain, even though it was not actually part of the list. We call that priming. In this case, it's specifically semantic priming. Priming means to make something more accessible in your brain. Semantically, that, that's the meaning of the word. The meaning or the meaning of sleep is insinuated by all of these things. And so when we talk about the snore, lamp, et cetera, all those stuff are involved with sleep. And so the concept, the meaning of those words involves sleep. And so sleeping becomes more accessible in your brain. Is the word vomit on your list? 95% of the people remember the word vomit when we do this normally. Why? Because of conspicuity. It's conspicuous because it is different. We tend to notice unusual things because they're, they're conspicuous, they're different. And in this case, vomit was the word that was very, very different from the other words that were all related to sleep. Our memory is not a videotape and it is not a photograph. We use all sorts of different cues to remember things. And it's limited by how much, the quantity as well as the uh, capacity that we might have for remembering specific things. The last thing I wanna talk about is amnesia. So amnesia has to do with not being able to remember things. So if you have no memory of uh, 48 hours prior to sustaining a head injury in a car crash, what would that be? The difference between retrograde and anterograde amnesia is retro means past, right? From the past. Antero means after. So if you can't remember things before the event, that would be retrograde. So you think about this in terms of things before and after the incident that caused the memory loss. In this case, that's the car crash. So if you can't remember things before the car crash, that's retrograde. If you can't remember things after the car crash, that's anterograde. Retrograde before and after. All right, thanks everybody.